my fascinations. One of them will be in the neurology and the brain and the different things it tells itself and the different ways it tells itself things, how stories and memories change, especially how they change with damage brains. Um, and as a prelude to it, I'm going to read a Robert Frost poem because Robert Frost's poetry figures into it as well. I, I, uh, this is, as I say, a tribute poem of sorts, so I, I stole and mangled some of his lines to throw in here. So the Robert Frost poem is an old man's winter night. All out of doors look darkly in at him through the thin throb, through the thin frost, almost in separate stars that gathers on the pane in empty rooms. What kept his eyes from giving back the gaze was the lamp tilted near them in his hand. What kept him from remembering what it was that brought him to that creaking room was age. He stood with barrels around him at a loss. And heaven scared the cellar under him and clomping there. He scared it once again and clomping off. And scared the outer night, which has its sounds familiar, like the roar of trees and crack of branches, common things. But nothing so like beating on a box. A light he was to no one but himself. Where now he sat, concerned with he knew what, a quiet light, and then not even that. He consigned to the moon, such as she was so late arising, to the broken moon, as better than the sun in any case for such a church, his snow upon the roof, his icicles along the wall to keep slept. The log that shifted with a jolt once in the stove disturbed him and he shifted and eased his heavy breathing but still slept. One aged man, one man can't keep a face, a firm, a countryside, or if he can, it's thus he does it. in a stand of birch, a redneck neurological noir dare to first. <laughs> he didn't put He didn't hit me hard enough to put me out when he clicked me on the head with the new handle for the linning axe he just bought. What he just brought back from town. But he put me down. Somehow the chainsaw had been running, just kicking back into my eyebrows. And laying there in the snow, looking up into Duane's face, ash flecking from the cigarette burning as usual in one corner of his mouth. And I, I didn't have to wonder why. Sally will tell you a different story. The same one she told cops and courts. And maybe she's got the truth of it. But it's not what I remember. Well, they say a crack on the head can change a lot of things in the electric meat that sits inside our skulls and centers, all the daily dust of memory into the jagged lost and found things we are. And I know the doctors say I've changed, and I can see how they mean and know in the front of my mind they're right, but I don't feel it, so I can't believe it. The way I remember that day, it was like this. It was just after apple picking. The ladders were stoned, apples scratched, pulp pressed, and the cider vats full. The frost was settling into the soil, making the lowland woods passable. I was out there bringing down a birch, working a stand we'd been waiting, we'd been waiting years to harvest. And thinking how our father, 
when he'd get to winter drinking, would sit by the wood stove on snowy evenings and recite poems. He was especially partial to a line about a pathless wood, but the poem itself would piss him off. Nobody's ever lived too far from town to learn baseball. All you need is a stick and a rock wrap and string. So don't let me catch you little buggers out there swinging on birches. He could never get over saying. Because by God, good birches make good switches. And good switches make red arses. And it's bright red arses you'll have if that wood's too bad and bold for the mill. That was what was in my head when it happened. My father, the memory of birches, and the feel of the chainsaw bucking in my palms. As I said, he didn't hit me hard enough to put me out when he clipped me on the head with the new handle. For the living axe, he'd gone home to whittle from a, stis from a stick of ash, but he put me down. Somehow the chainsaw had been running, only clipped my ear when it kicked back at my head. And laying there in the leaves, looking up into the rain's face, the drying white flecks of foam caked in the corner of his mouth like stray ash blown from his smoke. And I didn't have to wonder why. There was no wind in the woods. The ash was flaking off because the tremor in his lower lip was making his smoke bounce and dip like the bobber on a fishing line when a trout is just bit. So he knew about his wife and me. And brother, when it's a brother you've been messing around behind, you take the axe handle to the head and you take more lying down. I took it. I took my bruises where and as he gave them, shown to the shin. And then Dwayne picked me up threw me on the sledge behind the Massey Harris and dragged me over the frost eaves and stumps of the wood road to my trailer, dropped me beside my woodshed, and said, she's waiting for you, and you're done cutting work with me, and I am damn well done with you. I ain't broke none of your bones, so you crawl inside best you can and live or die and just so choose. He left me there and headed back to the woods. And I crawled inside, and Sally lay there, bleeding from her mouth. Her face was broke. Her jaw was crooked. One cheekbone will never heal up straight, they say. I think she visits sometimes, or so it seems. And I tell her about Dad, and how he said he liked the broken moon better than the sun. As she never minded her father his icicles, or the snow upon his roof. And he swore the jolt of logs shifting in the stove was her way of reaching down to him. Yeah, I think she visits sometimes, and softly speaks of woods lovely, dark, and deep. He headed back to the woods, I think you know, and the chainsaw waited there among the birches, blood, and frost. <laughs>